The first thing we know about the universe is that it's really, really big. And because the universe is so big, it's often beyond the reach of our instruments and of our ideas. Cosmologist Michael Turner. From the first stone tools to seafaring ships to the internet, technology has been at the heart of human exploration and discovery. But to start exploring space, the final frontier, humans first had to master a deceptively simple piece of technology, the telescope. Telescopes have opened a window into a world of science that before we couldn't have imagined it. But while our knowledge of the universe has grown exponentially because of telescopes, they also challenge the prevailing science and status quo every step of the way. This is also true for James Webb. The hype surrounding the largest telescope we've ever launched into space was big and decades long, but as the stunning James Webb images show, its view of the universe is groundbreaking. In an extraordinary discovery, James Webb has just captured seven colossal structures at the edge of the observable universe, shedding light on formative years in the history of the universe that have thus far been beyond reach, the formation and assembly of first galaxies. Join us as we dig deep into James Webb's shocking discovery that will blow your mind. For as long as humans have roamed the Earth, we have sought to find our place in the cosmos. From the city-states of ancient Greece to the soaring capstones of the Egyptian pyramids, across the deserts and towering mountains of ancient China down to the rolling plains of Mesoamerica, humans have sought to understand how the universe works. They developed mathematics to trace the motions of the planets, estimated the circumference of the Earth by walking from city to city, created star tables and timekeeping codices, and even recorded celestial events like Halley's Comet, Supernovae, and Eclipses. With time, we have refined our models of the universe. Using ellipses, Johannes Kepler reconfigured celestial motions. Galileo revolutionized Copernicus's heliocentric model of the solar system by discovering that the Sun, not the Earth, is the body around which all other elements of the solar system orbit. Isaac Newton developed the theory of gravity, which was later supplanted by Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Discovery by discovery, we paint in the gaps of the picture of our universe, and yet somehow, with each brushstroke, that image morphs, evolving into something ever-changing, new, and unrecognizable. The universe that Kepler and Galileo, Copernicus and Kepler, Newton and Galileo, and even Einstein understood is different from the one we know today. Today's understanding of the universe is unsettling. It is not one that fits in a tidy little box with neat lines and a perfect lid. Our universe is mystifying and complex. It defies expectations. For starters, our universe is not a static, enclosed entity. Our universe is expanding. From everywhere all at once, the fabric of space-time is stretching away from everywhere else like an inflating balloon, carrying galaxies along with it. Photons, traveling the lanes of the cosmos, are stretched along with space-time their wavelengths growing ever longer or redder, thus red shifting with the expansion of space. Our universe isn't expanding into anything. To our knowledge, there is no extra dimension around the universe. Rather, space itself is expanding, causing the space between galaxy clusters, the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe, to get bigger and bigger with time. And this leads us to the following unsettling conclusion. There's no center to our universe. Everywhere is the center because everything everywhere is moving away from everything else all at once. But the universe isn't just expanding, it's accelerating. With each passing moment, an unknown, repulsive, persistent force dubbed dark energy is stretching the fabric of the universe. Dark energy is a fundamental property of space itself, invisible, smooth and constant, and yet we are entirely unsure what it truly is. And then there is dark matter, the invisible, clumpy matter that binds galaxies together. In many ways, 
Dark matter is the corollary to dark energy. Where dark energy stretches space apart, dark matter knits matter together. They are both invisible, neither interacts with radiation or light, and yet they are ever-present, dark matter acting as the cosmic glue for large-scale structure formation and dark energy a principal ingredient in the universe's evolution. The afterglow of the Big Bang, known as the cosmic microwave background, is imprinted on the fabric of space-time, a relic of radiation from when the universe was extraordinarily hot, dense and, and smooth. By mapping its bumps and irregularities and comparing with galaxy surveys, scientists have found that 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy. Meanwhile, 25% of the universe is dark matter. Just 5% of the universe is ordinary matter. That's the ordinary matter of everyday life. Your hair and clothes, your atoms and organs, the food you eat, and the dogs that kiss you, the air and the sea, the sun and the moon. Everything we know, everything we see, is just 5% of everything in the universe. The remaining 95% of the universe is stuff that we can't see, don't yet understand. An extraordinarily vast portion of the cosmos is still unknown. Despite the technological advancements of the last century, even with computers at our fingertips, and the worldwide internet and space-based observatories mapping the far reaches of our universe, there is still so much that we don't understand. We have grown leaps and bounds since the days of the ancient Greeks and Egyptians, even since Copernicus and Kepler. But in many ways, we are still novices playing with toy models, seeking to understand the stars. At the end of the day, we are on a lone planet dangling in space, orbiting our sun, amidst millions of other stars in a small corner of a galaxy in an ever-expanding universe. It is in our nature as humans to seek meaning in the stars. But sometimes the answers aren't the ones we were searching for. The history of science could be written as a history of instrumentation. From particle accelerators and microscopes to functional magnetic resonance imagings and telescopes, as instruments become more powerful, they act as reality amplifiers. They magnify our view of the very small and the very large, allowing us a glimpse of what is invisible to the human eye. It is hard to imagine that, up to 1609, all we knew about the skies depended on what we can see with the naked eye. When Galileo Galilei had the insight to aim his telescope at the night sky, he saw what no human had seen before, a new sky full of surprises and possibility. This new sky would reveal a new world order, out with the Aristotelian view of an Earth-centered cosmos, a frozen sky where celestial objects were perfect and unchangeable, and in with a marvelously imperfect heaven, a moon full of craters and mountains, Jupiter with four orbiting moons, now we know there are about 79 and counting, a Saturn with ears, that is, the rings that his telescope could not yet resolve, and a Milky Way made of a countless number of stars. New instruments hold the promise of a worldview transformation. As we look deep into nature, our vision of reality and us in it changes. And with the addition of James Webb to the arsenal of tools astronomers have, the whole world is nervously awaiting a new era of astronomy. Even if often called the successor of the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope is a different kind of machine. Perhaps Hubble is the most successful instrument in astronomical history. Beyond its optical capability that reveals to us parts of the universe we could in principle see with our limited human vision, it has additional infrared and ultraviolet instruments that have revolutionized the way we understand the cosmic history and the stunning wealth of galaxies spread throughout space. But the Hubble was launched in 1990, and it is time for a new instrument to step up and expand upon its groundwork, deepening our understanding of the universe near and far. And then came Webb, the largest, most powerful observatory ever launched from Earth was built to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Stationed 1.5 million kilometers away from earthly interference and chilled close to absolute zero by its tennis court-sized sunshade, the telescope's giant segmented mirror 
and exquisitely sensitive infrared instruments were designed to uncover details of cosmic dawn never before observed. But perhaps the biggest surprise, other than the astounding technical performance of the telescope, which is arguably twice as good as it was designed to achieve on many fronts, is what it's seen in the realm of galaxies. While we knew James Webb would push far past what Hubble's limited capabilities have seen, we had no idea its performance would be so revolutionary in such an early stage of its observation campaigns. There are greater numbers of galaxies out there than Hubble ever saw, including at distances that Hubble would never be sensitive to. Some of these galaxies appear more evolved, more massive, and at earlier stages than not only we'd previously seen, but than many models and simulations had expected. Some of them might even be massive and quite evolved at epochs between 200 and 350 million years after the Big Bang. The previous confirmed record holder from Hubble was already 407 million years after the Big Bang. Many of these galaxies, even the earliest ones, are shaped like disks rather than being irregular. Webb's superior resolving power and imaging capabilities have shown this even for galaxies that previously, with Hubble, looked like irregular blobs. And finally, nearby galaxies, in contrast to what Hubble saw, appear smaller and more compact with Webb's improved resolution. This is interesting, particularly to scientists, in a lot of ways. We mentioned earlier that the fluctuations that the universe was born with had a particular set of properties, many of which probably sounded like jargon to you. In plain English, what this means for all cosmic distance scales is that 16% of those fluctuations are denser than average by 0.03% so or more. 2.5% of them are overdense by 0.006% or more. 0.15% of them are overdense by 0.0009% or more. 0.05% of them are overdense by 0.022% or more, and only 0.01% of them are initially overdense by 0.015% or more. Even if we take these rare large initial fluctuations and let them grow at the maximum allowable rate, it's very difficult to get enough galaxies that will be massive enough, evolved enough, and that will form early enough to be consistent with James Webb's observations. This set of observations presents an exciting challenge for our modern cosmological theories and an exciting challenge for cosmologists to try and puzzle out. Why do these galaxies have the properties that they do? Can our standard model of cosmology be reconciled with these observations? And if not, what sort of implications does that have for what else we might learn about dark matter the expanding universe, or other aspects of our cosmic history. These are all legitimate research questions that people are actively working on right now, at this very moment. However, while James Webb call into question our cosmology, it's also continuing to provide answers about the earliest days of the universe. In a breathtaking discovery, this time machine has begun to shed light on formative years in the history of the universe that have thus far been beyond reach. The formation and assembly of galaxies. For the first time, a proto-cluster of seven galaxies has been confirmed at a distance that astronomers refer to as Redshift 7.9, or a mere 650 million years after the Big Bang. Based on the data collected, astronomers calculated the nascent cluster's future development finding that it will likely grow in size and mass to resemble the Coma Cluster, a monster of the modern universe. According to Takahiro Morishita of Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, California Institute of Technology, the lead author of the study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, this is a very special, unique site of accelerated galaxy evolution. And Webb gave us the unprecedented ability to measure the velocities of these seven galaxies and confidently confirm that they are bound together in a protocluster. The precise measurements captured by Webb's near-infrared spectrograph instrument were key to confirming the galaxy's collective distance 
and the high velocities at which they are moving within a halo of dark matter, more than 2 million miles per hour or 1,000 kilometers per second. The spectral data allowed astronomers to model and map the future development of the gathering group all the way to our time in the modern universe. The prediction that the proto-cluster will eventually resemble the coma cluster means that it could eventually be among the densest known galaxy collections, with thousands of members. We can see these distant galaxies like small drops of water in different rivers, and we can see that eventually they will all become part of one big, mighty river," said Benedetta Volcani of the National Institute of Astrophysics in Italy, another member of the research team. Galaxy clusters are the greatest concentrations of mass in the known universe, which can dramatically warp the fabric of space-time itself. This warping, called gravitational lensing, can have a magnifying effect for objects beyond the cluster, allowing astronomers to look through the cluster like a giant magnifying glass. The research team was able to utilize this effect, looking through Pandora's cluster, to view the protocluster. Even Webb's powerful instruments need an assist from nature to see so far. Exploring how large clusters like Pandora and Coma first came together has been difficult, due to the expansion of the universe stretching light beyond visible wavelengths into the infrared, where astronomers lacked high-resolution data before Webb. Webb's infrared instruments were developed specifically to fill in these gaps at the beginning of the universe's story. The seven galaxies confirmed by Webb were first established as candidates for observation using data from the Hubble Space Telescope's Frontier Fields program. The program dedicated Hubble time to observations using gravitational lensing to observe very distant galaxies in detail. However, because Hubble cannot detect light beyond near-infrared, there is only so much detail it can see. Webb picked up the investigation, focusing on the galaxies scouted by Hubble and gathering detailed spectroscopic data in addition to imagery. The research team anticipates that future collaboration between Webb and NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, a high-resolution wide-field survey mission, will yield even more results on early galaxy clusters. With 200 times Hubble's infrared field of view in a single shot, Roman will be able to identify more proto-cluster galaxy candidates, which Webb can follow up to confirm with its spectroscopic instruments. The Roman mission is currently targeted for launch by May 2027. According to Tommaso Treu of the University of California, Los Angeles, a member of the protocluster research team, it is amazing the science we can now dream of doing now that we have Webb. With this small protocluster of seven galaxies, at this great distance, we had a 100% spectroscopic confirmation rate demonstrating the future potential for mapping dark matter and filling in the timeline of the universe's early development. In another remarkable finding, James Webb has just gazed at the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant located 6,500 light-years away in the constellation Taurus. Since the recording of this energetic event by 11th century astronomers, the Crab Nebula has continued to draw attention and additional study as scientists seek to understand the conditions, behavior, and after-effects of supernovae through thorough study of the crab, a relatively nearby example. Uncovering the details of the initial explosion required looking back through worldwide records, as no Western or European sources recorded it. The first discovered source came from the Chinese Empire, where astronomers recorded what they called a guest star, first appearing on July 4, 1054. Contemporaneously, sightings were recorded in Japan and the Middle East, revealing that this star remained visible for around two years, before fading away below the naked eye threshold. In hindsight, this is fairly typical behavior for a core collapse supernova, swiftly rising to a tremendous peak brightness that's thousands to millions of times the brightness of the original star, then gradually fading away over the span of months to years. Then, hundreds of years later, the remnant of this ancient explosion, although the connection wasn't made until much later, 
was discovered by John Bevis back in 1731. Of course, back in the early 18th century, astronomers weren't much interested in these fuzzy smudges that appeared in the sky. They were interested in things that were nearby, like planets, moons, and comets. That's why Bevis's discovery went largely unnoticed until 1758, when Halley's comet was due to return. The comet, previously seen in 1456, 1531, 1607, and 1682, was now due to return, as predicted by Edmund Halley back in 1705, although Halley had died back in 1742. Astronomer Charles Messier had taken up searching for the comet's return. While searching a particular part of the sky, he accidentally noticed this object, and first confused it for the vaunted comet before realizing his mistake. Messier, determined not to let these permanent objects in the night sky confuse other comet-hunting astronomers, began creating the famous astronomical catalog of objects that bears his name, the Messier Catalog. This object, now known as the Crab Nebula, became the very first object that Messier would catalog, and it still bears the designation of M1, Messier 1. It's now been an impressive 265 years since its rediscovery, and this nebula remains a fascinating object of study for a large number of bona fide reasons more than could possibly fit into a single article. However, some of its remarkable properties include, it's one of the closest core collapse supernovae to occur in modern human history. At only 6,500 light years away, it's possible to resolve individual features within it, including gas filaments and wind-driven ejecta. We can physically see the nebula itself expanding over time and we can determine that its core is powered by a fascinating stellar remnant, a young pulsar or a neutron star that spins around on its axis an impressive 30 times per second. This object remains a delight to amateurs and professionals alike, as practically anyone with a telescope can find it and view it for themselves. With off-the-shelf equipment, even a dedicated amateur can measure the expansion of this nebula over decade-long timescales. Today it's got a remarkable set of properties to it, which have been revealed through a variety of observations that span the full gamut of electromagnetic wavelengths. Back in 1054, this supernova reached a peak brightness that saw it shine as bright as 400 million suns, all combined. Now, 969 years after it first detonated, the supernova remnant spans a full 11 light years across, from end to end with the outskirts still expanding at 0.5% of light speed, around 1,500 kilometers. X-ray observations, such as those taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, are the best at revealing the hot gases and plasmas created by the central pulsar, including how those features change over time in a movie-like format. And it's the innermost regions around the pulsar itself, where relativistic, rapidly accelerating matter is present that generates winds that transport material and energy to the outer portions of the nebula, driven largely by electrons moving near the speed of light. The visually stunning filaments in the outer regions, observable in Hubble images, only change and grow relatively slowly, as the shocks and instabilities in that region are rather insensitive to short-term changes in the nebula's overall behavior. When we take a multi-wavelength view of this object, we can see a variety of features and infer a large amount of information about the physical properties of this supernova remnant and the event that gave rise to it. The central pulsar, first discovered only in 1968, is the young neutron star left behind by the supernova event of 1054. The pulsar itself is slowly changing in period is only about 1,010 kilometers in radius and contains a mass of about 1.4 solar masses. The majority of the light coming from the Crab Nebula is far more energetic than what the Sun produces, where it's actually the brightest X-ray source in the entire sky. The heated material surrounding the central star also emits a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light. If you added up all the light coming from the Crab Nebula, total, you'd find it still 75,000 times as luminous as our sun overall. 
Many elements, including hydrogen, oxygen, silicon, and more, have been discovered in the Crab Nebula, providing evidence that many of the elements heavier than oxygen but lighter than zirconium are primarily produced in core collapse supernova. And at lower energies, gaseous filaments, ejected jets of material, and ionized loops of gas appear. These can be combined into a single composite image, showcasing just how varied and intricate the Crab Nebula truly is. But even with all this information, there's still a problem that emerges when it comes to the Crab Nebula, the problem of mass. Astronomers are a big fan of the idea that a star's initial mass, the amount of mass that it has when it's born, is what determines its eventual fate. We know that this is largely true as stars like the Sun, which generally includes stars between 40% and 800% the mass of the Sun, will burn through their core hydrogen, evolve into red giants, begin fusing helium in their cores, and then will gently die, blowing off their outer layers into a planetary nebula while their cores contract to form a white dwarf. The lowest mass stars, which include stars below 40% of the sun's mass, will have time to fully convect, bringing burned material out of the core and into the star's outer layers, while bringing new, hydrogen-rich material into the core. When these stars run out of hydrogen, they won't get hot enough to fuse helium, leading to a state of slow contraction, ending in a white dwarf. But the highest mass stars, born with eight solar masses of material or more, will not only ignite hydrogen and then helium burning in their cores, but will go on to fuse carbon, neon, oxygen, and then silicon and sulfur, eventually dying in core collapse supernova, leading to a neutron star for the lower mass varieties and a black hole for the more massive ones. That's where the big puzzle arises. There just isn't enough mass in the Crab Nebula as inferred by these multi-wavelength observations to explain its core collapse supernova and neutron star fate. The Crab Pulsar, or the neutron star at its core, comes in at only 1.4 solar masses. From all the previous multi-wavelength data, we've been able to constrain the mass of the Crab Nebula to be between 2 and 5 solar masses, with obviously a fair amount of uncertainty there. But observations at greater distances around the nebula where it's plausible that a shell of material could have been blown off in earlier stages reveal a complete absence of any detectable material at all. There's no shell, plasma, or diffuse gas present to the absolute limits that our instruments can see. Even if we take the high mass value for the Crab Nebula, that still doesn't give us enough matter or material to trigger a core collapse supernova. There's got to be a flaw in our understanding somewhere, but exactly where is a big mystery. Could we be modeling the nebula wrong? If so, improved data can help us better estimate the total mass of the Crab Nebula. Could we be measuring the mass of the neutron star incorrectly? It's possible, but not by that much. The most massive neutron star ever found is only slightly heavier than two solar masses. Could there be material that was ejected long ago that's now been blown away? Perhaps. But that doesn't align very well with our understanding of stellar evolution in the late stages of a massive star's life. Could we be misunderstanding the conditions for a supernova? It's unlikely, but we've observed so few in detail that we have to consider it. Fortunately, we're about to get an assist from the full web view, now finally available, of the Crab Nebula. The greatest new detail that's finally revealed with James Webb imaging, something that quite notably Webb's predecessor, Spitzer, could not reveal, is the first complete and comprehensive map of the dust distribution within the Crab Nebula. Since the spectral features that reveal individual elements only apply to individual atoms, not to dust grains that may contain those elements, it's possible that we've failed to sufficiently account for dust in previous observations. As you can see, the central yellow, white, and green filaments that appear in the web's image are dust-dominated and could be incredibly rich in material. 
Also in the web images, as opposed to the optical Hubble images, you can see what appears as grayish-white smoke filling in the interior of the cavity carved by the expanding gases. This isn't smoke, by any means, but rather a phenomenon known as synchrotron radiation, where fast-moving electrons are accelerated by a strong magnetic field, and the action of that magnetic field causes the electrons to radiate electromagnetic radiation as they pass through the magnetic field. It just so happens that the wavelength range that the synchrotron radiation comes in matches the wavelengths that James Webb is sensitive to. On the outskirts of the nebula, you can see that the smoke-like wisps are curved and pinched, like they're being funneled into a central disk-like shape. While there are numerous possible explanations for this appearance, one tantalizing one is that there's a belt of dense gas confining where the supernova's winds can flow. This is another possible store of massive material that has gone undetected thus far. There are also hotter, heavier elements revealed by James Webb observations, particularly on the outskirts of the nebula. The red-orange filaments of gas seen by James Webb trace out doubly ionized sulfur atoms, which peter out at smaller distances than the lighter hydrogen atoms that Hubble was sensitive to farther toward the nebula's outer edges. But perhaps most interestingly, there are novel details revealed about the very heart of the nebula, in the region where the pulsar is located. The smoke-like wisps located toward the center trace out the magnetic field lines created by the central pulsar, and you can see many curved, wisp-like features all grouped together, indicating the locations where the magnetic field is strongest. This represents material still being transported away from the central regions of the nebula, farther toward the outskirts. You can also see, by looking at the full field view of these images, that there's an asymmetry. The filaments appear to be lengthened toward the upper right of the pulsar, while simultaneously being relatively shortened in the opposite direction. Although it's still worth additional efforts investigating this phenomenon, it's notable that the pulsar itself is moving toward the top right of the nebula. Perhaps the extent of the nebula has something to do with the motion of the central stellar remnant. Hubble hasn't taken another look at the Crab Nebula since the early 2000s, more than 20 years ago. But that's about to change. Just as James Webb is observing the nebula now, it's important to get simultaneous data from Hubble in order to paint a more complete picture of this fascinating region of the sky. Perhaps with new superior data from both observatories combined, we'll not only be able to map out the various details within it, but come up with a more satisfactory accounting of where all the mass is. The combination of a central pulsar ionized plasmas, a wide variety of atoms, dust grains, heated gas, and expanding matter, rich filaments, not only makes the Crab Nebula a spectacular sight for almost any observer or observatory, but a scientifically rich place to explore the universe. As the science papers associated with these images have yet to be published, it's sure to be an exciting time for anyone who wants to understand the in stages of a massive, but not ultra-massive, star's life. After all, this is one of the closest, best-studied examples in all the Milky Way galaxy. Meanwhile, elsewhere in lonely space, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft now cruises on its one-way trip out of our solar system, with little to pass the time besides sniffing whiffs of plasma and stargazing. After nearly two decades of deep space operations, the probe is currently more than 8 billion kilometers from Earth. And much like our planet itself, the mission's heyday, a historic encounter with Pluto in 2015, and a 2019 flyby of Arakoth, the most distant object yet visited by a spacecraft, is receding ever further in the rear view. Back on Earth, a battle has raged over the spacecraft's future. Pluto and Arakoth alike reside in what's known as the Kuiper Belt, a remote and mysterious orbital region of icy objects in the outer reaches of our solar system. New Horizons, humanity's first and so far only robotic emissary to explore the Kuiper Belt, 
still traverses its depths, dutifully gathering data and somewhat desperately searching for another object to intercept. Yet last year, NASA suggested it would end these investigations in an effort to save money, sparking an outcry from astronomers, given that no other spacecraft will explore the Kuiper Belt for decades. That decision, it seems, has been partly reversed. In a statement from NASA posted on September 29th, Nicola Fox, Associate Administrator of the Agency's Science Mission Directorate in Washington, D.C., announced some of New Horizons' Kuiper Belt. Science would continue. The agency decided that it was best to extend operations for New Horizons until the spacecraft exits the Kuiper Belt, which is expected in 2028 through 2029, Fox said. NASA's statement noted that the agency would assess the budget impact of continuing the New Horizons mission so far beyond its original plan of exploration and that other missions may be affected by the decision. Future projects may be impacted, the statement added. Alan Stern, a planetary astronomer at the Southwest Research Institute who leads the New Horizons mission, welcomed the decision. It is good news for Kuiper Belt exploration and very much welcomed by our team and also by the planetary science community, he says. Pontus Brandt of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory was similarly jubilant. The community and I are thrilled that this logjam is finally broken, he says. This was the right decision for Kuiper Belt science. Stern notes that some of the finer details are yet to be ironed out, however. It's not clear, for example, to what extent New Horizons' studies of the Kuiper Belt will continue, with NASA's recent statement noting that the agency's decision allows for the possibility of using the spacecraft for a future close flyby of a Kuiper Belt object. NASA launched the nearly $1 billion New Horizons mission in 2006 on its pioneering voyage to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. The probe's arrival at the dwarf planet nine years later was a stunning moment in space exploration, with New Horizons returning breathtaking images of a surprisingly complex world of craggy mountains of ice and seas of frozen nitrogen, as well as snapshots of Pluto's equally enthralling red-tinted moon Charon. The additional visit to Arakoth was a lucky bonus, achieved by dint of the Kuiper Belt object's timely discovery when it was still within reach of the approaching spacecraft's dwindling propellant reserves. The two flybys produced spectacular results, says Jane Liu of the University of Oslo, who co-discovered the Kuiper Belt in 1992. Although New Horizons' day-to-day -day operational needs are modest, they add up to a cost of nearly $10 million per year. Last year, NASA approved a mission extension, but only through September 2024 rather than 2025, as requested by Stern and his team. At that point, NASA had planned to end the spacecraft's planetary science studies in favor of a focus on heliophysics by repurposing New Horizons to exclusively examine how our home star shapes conditions in the outer solar system and toward the hazy boundary with interstellar space. That transition would swap the mission from NASA's planetary science division to its heliophysics division. And given that Stern and his team did not heed the space agency's request to submit a proposal by November 2022 to dedicate New Horizons solely to heliophysics, the transition would remove them from the mission too. We refused to write a proposal that terminated the Kuiper Belt science, Stern says. It's outrageous that you would terminate the only mission purpose built and sent to the Kuiper Belt while it's still collecting unique data. According to Jim Green, NASA's former chief scientist and former head of its planetary science efforts, such a heliocentric shift would have greatly limited the mission's scientific output. It basically pairs down the science team to next to nothing and really operates the spacecraft with a minimal cadre. From his perspective, if he was the division chief, he would not have made that decision. He says the reversal was a good decision and will allow the right science for the mission during the right times. The decision to halt New Horizons' Kuiper Belt studies originally emerged in 2022 from NASA's annual review of most of its planetary science missions, a process in which the Space Agency assesses their current status 
and future potential. Although this review acknowledged many benefits of New Horizons continuing its current mission, the report also flagged a key weakness. In the absence of a suitable rendezvous target, the spacecraft can only study Kuiper Belt objects from afar, and in far fewer numbers than what various ground-based telescopes can achieve, perhaps less than a dozen. The proposed studies of Kuiper Belt objects are unlikely to markedly improve knowledge, the review stated, noting the spacecraft's priorities should focus on heliophysics and astrophysics. Faith Vilas of the Planetary Science Institute, who led the team that assessed New Horizons for the review, says she and her colleagues did not intend their work to justify ending the mission's planetary science studies. The team was being credited or blamed for the mission potentially losing the planetary science side of things, she says. We didn't say that. We simply said that all the science together is greater in magnitude than the one portion of science. Stern says the mission still has much to offer as it moves through the Kuiper Belt, including feats that cannot be replicated on Earth, such as observing the changing brightness of Kuiper Belt objects as they rotate. When you do that repeatedly from different angles, you can determine the shape, he says, but you can never do that from Earth because you never see the Kuiper Belt objects from significantly different angles. The spacecraft can also search for binaries, co-orbiting Kuiper Belt objects, in a way Earth-based observers cannot and can collect dust scattered away from distant Kuiper Belt objects. The prospect of visiting a third object remains ever-present, too, if a viable target can be found. The spacecraft is projected to exit the known boundaries of the Kuiper Belt in 2028, at which point Stern agrees the Kuiper Belt science could end. By some estimates, the spacecraft could continue operating until 2050, when it will be far beyond the generally accepted boundary of interstellar space. At present, no other spacecraft bound for the Kuiper Belt is in development. The next possibility might be Interstellar Probe, a proposal from Applied Physics Laboratory to send a spacecraft to interstellar space. According to Ralph McNutt, who helms the proposal team at Applied Physics Laboratory, optimistically assuming interstellar probe becomes a reality and launches in 2036, that would get you out to the same region of space as New Horizons, probably within a decade or so, so potentially up to the mid-2040s. In June, Green and other members of the space science community signed a letter to NASA urging the space agency to reconsider its decision and noted alarm at the proposed abandonment of Kuiper Belt science. We, Ask NASA, the administration, and Congress to reverse course, they wrote. In September, the U.S.-based National Space Society made a similar appeal in its own letter. Continue new horizons so we don't miss out on new discoveries from this rare, perfectly positioned, and fully functional mission, the letter stated. Not all astronomers agree that new horizons remaining Kuiper Belt investigations will be worthwhile, however. Lou says, transitioning the mission to a focus on heliophysics and astrophysics would be a reasonable decision, because ground-based telescopes can surpass the spacecraft's Kuiper Belt capabilities in many respects, especially by studying many more Kuiper Belt objects at a much faster cadence. If you just want to use the spacecraft for monitoring Kuiper Belt objects, I would argue it might be better done from the ground, she says. And the prospects of a third flyby are becoming increasingly remote because no obvious targets have been discovered. If they find a new candidate, great, but the low-hanging fruits have been picked, she says. Mike Brown of the California Institute of Technology, who discovered the object Eris in 2003, which led to Pluto's demotion from a planet to a dwarf planet, has similar concerns. He said that these decisions are always tough. There is a spacecraft there, it can do unique things, but ultimately it is a zero-sum cost benefit analysis. Unless there is a new target for a close flyby, it's hard for me to see why spending a ton of money is justified. If the science can be done on a shoestring, then perhaps that's fine. But of course, a shoestring in space is probably many full scientific programs on Earth. For now, New Horizons will continue its studies of the Kuiper Belt, 
and will remain the only spacecraft likely to do so for many years to come. What knock-on effects its ongoing operations will have on future projects alluded to by NASA remains to be seen. Far beyond Pluto, one of our most distant emissaries still speeds on into the unknown. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.